Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. We have a terrific show for you today about Lincoln, slavery, and the refounding of America. Leading constitutional scholar Noah Feldman is with us. He is a professor at Harvard Law School who testified in favor of the first impeachment of Donald Trump. Professor Feldman has written a compelling book entitled The Broken Constitution, in which he argues that the Constitution of 1789 was a compromise constitution, which Abraham Lincoln shredded in order to create the moral constitution we have today. Historian John Meacham called the book an insightful and talented exploration of our greatest president's complicated relationship with a document he revered and changed forever. We're very much honored to have Professor Noah Feldman on the program. Well, thanks so much for doing this, and congratulations on your book, which for me as a lawyer was uh, just fascinating, and also as someone who has uh, a passing knowledge of the Civil War era. But what I wanted to ask you is the broken Constitution. You weren't writing about uh, overruling Roe v. Wade or uh, gun rights. You were writing about something else. So why don't you tell us where you got your title and why you think the Constitution was broken? Thank you, Jim, and thank you very much for having me. The Constitution that I'm describing as having been broken was the original Constitution, the one drafted in 1787 and ratified a couple of years after that, that persisted up until the run-up to the Civil War. And the first sign that that Constitution was broken was, of course, that seven states, and eventually more, seceded from the Union or claimed to be able to secede from the Union. And they were literally saying that they could break the promises that those states had made when they entered into the Constitution. They believed that that was their right under the Constitution. They said, we ratified it so we can unratify it. And of course, Lincoln, acting on behalf of the Union, took the opposite view and rejected that as an invalid attempt to secede from the Union. And so in that sense, the Constitution was already broken, but it didn't stop there. Lincoln himself had to make three really fundamental major decisions in his presidency to try to preserve and recreate the Union. And I suggest in the book that each of those involved breaking the Constitution as he and others at the time understood it. And the first of those was to go to war, to force the Southern states back into the Union, which we now think of as so obvious um, as part of the Constitution that we don't even notice it, but actually it doesn't say anywhere in the Constitution you can do that. And contemporaries didn't think you should be able to do that. He then suspended habeas corpus, which is, as you know, is the right to uh, have a court review every act in which the government grabs you up and detains you. And the Constitution says that Congress can do that under times of emergency, but Lincoln did it on his own without Congress, and he continued to do it for several years. And last but not least, Lincoln issued eventually, it took a while, the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed enslaved people in the Confederacy, even though he himself, in his years running up to the presidency, and even for the first year of his presidency, believe that that was beyond his constitutional powers. So my suggestion is that Lincoln himself took the already broken constitution and broke it even further in the hopes of recreating it into something new. Well, of course, we think of uh, Lincoln as a, a towering figure, a, a great emancipator, a, a great libertarian, a protector of civil liberties and civil rights. And uh, here you argue in your book that uh, he really broke the constitution. I mean, let's take habeas corpus, uh, well, it doesn't say in the Constitution that uh, only Congress can suspend the writ of habeas corpus, although it's found in Article I. Uh, but Lincoln decided, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, flying in the face of a decision of the Chief Justice, uh, Roger Taney in ex party Merriman, that uh, uh, he could suspend the writ of habeas corpus. And his explanation, which he gave on the July 4th following uh, his inauguration, uh, was that uh, it was an emergency and uh, the executive had the power to do that. It sounds something like uh, the theory of uh, the unitary presidency espoused by uh, supporters of Donald Trump. Was Lincoln a, uh, a tyrant? Was he a usurper? I don't think Lincoln was a tyrant, but I do think that he was something very close to a constitutional dictator when he suspended habeas corpus. So to take a step back, I want to be clear um, that in my book, I actually do say, and I believe, that Lincoln was a great president and that the act of emancipation, which did break the Constitution as he understood it, 
was morally justified and he was right to do it. But Lincoln was not a great respecter of civil liberties as president, not at all. And the clearest example of that is the one you just mentioned, his suspension of habeas corpus, which he used to have arrested, we don't know exactly how many, but between 15,000 and 40,000 Americans uh, over the course of the war, all of them with no charges, no trial, indefinite detention, usually in military prisons, um, just on the say-so of the president for the great majority of the time that he was doing that. At the end, Congress validated it, but that took a long time. And most of those people who were arrested were critics of the war effort. Um, and that included a lot of newspaper editors and a lot of writers and a lot of people who just thought that the war was a bad idea and should be ended. Because in Lincoln's view, since the goal of the war was to force the South back in, if you ended the war without doing that, then you had lost the war. And so anyone who opposed the war was arguing for the Confederacy to win, according to Lincoln. So that's, I think, the sort of the framing issue. And, you know, in terms of the suspension of habeas corpus, when the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court issues an opinion that says that you've broken the Constitution, and just about all legal observers in the country agree with that, and you say, well, I'm the president, and I have the army, and I've ordered the army to arrest people, and I've ordered the army to ignore the courts when they tell me to release people, then there's nobody else left in the system who could check the presidency. And that is what a dictatorship looks like. Uh, let's go back to uh, the Constitution of 1789, because uh, we hear so often that we are the country that has the oldest continuous written Constitution, but hasn't been continuous. Uh, uh, you go back to 1789, did the so-called, you call it, the Compromise Constitution of 1789, did it approve of slavery? Absolutely, it did. It provided in three provisions that slavery would be protected and would continue. Um, we know about the Three-Fifths Compromise, which is probably the one that's most famous to us. Um, that just had to do with the extent to which enslaved people would be counted. Three-fifths of a slave uh, would be counted. Sorry, three, a slave counted as three-fifths of an of a, of a un, unenslaved person, for, of a free person for purposes of counting. But there was also the Fugitive Slave Clause which said that if someone escaped from slavery and went to a free state where slavery was not recognized by law, that free state had to send the person back to slavery. And the northern states fully understood that this is the deal that they were signing. They didn't much like it subsequently, but all the northern states enforced the Fugitive Slave Clause subsequently. And that forced even the free states, the so-called free states, to recognize and acknowledge the legality and the legitimacy of slavery. So yes, the Constitution acknowledged slavery and it effectively enshrined slavery. It did so without ever mentioning the word slavery because the framers were embarrassed. So they used euphemisms um, rather than using the word slave. But the reality was that the principle of slavery was protected by that Constitution and remained protected up until the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, is there one word in the 1789 uh, Constitution that disapproves of slavery? Not a breath. And not only that, we tend to forget this, but the very concept of equality before the law or equal protection of the laws doesn't appear in the Constitution of 1787 to 1789. It's not there at all. You know, we look at the Supreme Court and the sign on the top says equal justice under law, but that principle is only a product of the 14th Amendment with its guarantee of the equal protection of the laws. It's nowhere in that original Constitution. And that's because the framers knew that if they put the word equality in there, they would have been a laughing stock unless they had defined equality to say that it excluded enslaved people and they were not prepared to, to be that explicit. So they just didn't put equality in there at all. Okay, so in order to uh, free the slaves, uh, Lincoln, you argue, uh, had to break or breach uh, the Compromise Constitution, uh, which uh, was a courageous and extraordinary act. Uh, and Now, did he have any constitutional basis to free the slaves in uh, 1863 in his Emancipation Proclamation? He worked his way up to it. So mm -hmm. in the first months of his presidency, after the war had begun, one of his generals started freeing enslaved people who had, uh, who he judged, that general judged, to have been enslaved by disloyal slave owners, disloyal to the Union. And Lincoln told him, stop. And when he wouldn't, Lincoln fired him, and Lincoln reversed course. And in a letter to one of his friends, dated about a year, exactly a year, in fact, 
before Lincoln himself unveil, unveiled a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln said that to free the slaves would just be an act of dictatorship. That's Lincoln's word, dictatorship. So I'm not using that for Lincoln. That's the word he used to describe what that would be. Now, over the next year, and I show this in a lot of detail in the book, Lincoln played around with different ideas about how to handle the phenomenon of slavery. And through his experience of relying on the doctrine of necessity, the idea that he had to suspend habeas corpus to save the Union, he made his way towards the view slowly that he had to do whatever was necessary to win the war and that the Constitution allowed him to do whatever was necessary to win the war. And then he began to say that freeing enslaved people in the Confederacy was a necessary measure to win the war. And if it was necessary, that it was within his power. And that was a hard conclusion for him to reach because historically Americans had not believed that it was within the power of an occupying army to take away the property, especially the human property, the enslaved people, uh, of people who lived, in, uh, who lived under their rule. So Lincoln was reversing a traditional point of view that lots of Americans had held, but he got himself there. And so the, by the time he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, the basis that was given was that he needed to win the war, he was commander in chief, and he could do whatever it took. Now, of course, uh, Lincoln was really a uh, Johnny come lately uh, to abolition, wasn't he? Because uh, he was a great fan of Henry Clay, the great compromiser, and basically the compromise was that the South could have slavery uh, within its borders, and only new states uh, would uh, be disqualified from uh, entering the Union as slave states, or, uh, uh, and the territories could be uh, excluded from slavery because the Constitution uh, gave Congress control over the, the, the territories, as well as to regulate the admission of new states. So uh, uh, isn't it true that his thinking about slavery really evolved? And what happened that really uh, changed his position uh, from uh, being the great compromiser to uh, the great emancipator? Yes, his position evolved radically. From his first entrance into public life as a young man, through his run for the Senate uh, unsuccessfully um, uh, in uh, the 1850s, up to his run for the presidency in 1860, he consistently said the president has no authority to end slavery in the states. And indeed, he said so in his first inaugural address. Um, you know, when you go to the Lincoln Memorial, you see up on the walls, there's the second inaugural address, and there's the Gettysburg Address, but there's no sign of the first inaugural address. And I always wondered why that was until I read it and discovered that it begins by saying, I have no right to interfere with slavery and no intention to interfere with slavery. So yeah, that was his long-held view. In order to shift to this uh, transformed view, he had to be motivated by a realization that the war wasn't working. The war wasn't working in large part, I think Lincoln came to believe, because it lacked a clear moral vision. So at the beginning of the war, Lincoln thought that the North wasn't interested in ending slavery, but would stand up for protection of the Union. And he was advised by his advisors to emphasize Union rather than freedom for enslaved people. But as the war progressed, I think he came to realize that to just say our goal is to restore the Constitution, which meant restoring slavery, was not very inspiring to anybody on the side of prosecuting the war. And he needed a better narrative. And the narrative of the fundamental transformation as a solution to the Union and as a solution to our constitutional challenges got more and more attractive to him. And that combined with his personal dislike of slavery, which in the past he had always said, I don't like slavery, but the Constitution mandates that it continue to exist. Then he shifted to the Constitution gives me a way to end slavery, and I'm going to do it. Well, uh, of course, not everyone agrees with you uh, <laughs> and your interpretation. Uh, uh, John Quincy Adams uh, thought that uh, uh, Lincoln uh, had the constitutional power to free the slaves. Uh, Frederick Douglass hailed the Constitution of 1789 as a, a bulwark of liberty and a, a great uh, civil liberties document. Um, and, of course, you dispute that. And uh, Professor Willens at, at Princeton says, well, you have the promote the general welfare clause, and it uh, 
the uh, original Constitution gave Congress power over the territories and the admission of new states, and so it was really uh, the, the framers uh, were sounding the death knell, the eventual death knell of slavery over some period of time. Uh, what's the answer to that? Well, let me take each of those in turn, and I'll, I'll be brief about them. Um, John Quincy Adams, um, who had a one brief disastrous term as president, did in fact say in Congress during the Mexican-American War um, that he could imagine that in theory the president would have the authority to free slaves in occupied territory. And that was a radical, fascinating view that nobody paid any attention to at the time um, until Lincoln decided to do, to do that. And suddenly that view was brought back into prominence. So for sure that existed. But Adams himself, at different times in his career, had been a major figure in arguing that it was not within the law of war to free slaves. So it just depended on the stage of his career that Adams was at. He, he took both positions at different times. Something similar is true, actually, of the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass. For the first 15 years of his public career as an abolitionist, Douglass believed um, with uh, um, William Lloyd Garrison, the, the other, one of the other very famous abolitionists, that the Constitution was what they called an agreement with death and a covenant with hell, and was fundamentally illegitimate because of slavery. And over the course of his career, Douglass reevaluated his position because he realized that being against the Constitution was not a very way, good way to convince white Americans to oppose slavery. And so he wrote a newspaper article called A Shift in Opinion in his own newspaper, where he said, I've changed my mind. I used to think the Constitution was fundamentally pro-slavery. Now I think the Constitution is fundamentally anti-slavery. And you know, I have the, only the greatest respect for that process. He was trying to come up with a theory that would enable the freeing of African Americans who were enslaved. And anything he, I think that he would have said would have been justified. But he himself, I think, reached that view out of pragmatism rather than out of principle. Uh, last but not least, uh, you know, Professor Wilentz thinks that um, he's one of those people who thinks that even the Constitution of 1787 was not really pro-slavery because it didn't um, use the word slavery. And he wrote a book about that called No Property in Man. And I, I guess my feeling is that he's using an argument that no one at the time took seriously as a legal argument um, that ignores the Fugitive Slave Clause entirely, and ignores also, more importantly, the economic, social, and political reality, which was that slavery was the law of the land and remained so throughout that entire historical period. So I, I respect that Professor Valence wants us to love our Constitution, and I think he's worried that we won't love our Constitution if we acknowledge that it had slavery in it. But my own view is that we can be grown-ups about this. We can acknowledge that our framers, whom I revere, were slaveholders in some cases. James Madison is a great example. I wrote a full biography of James Madison. He's a genius, a great, great constitutional inventor, and a slaveholder his entire life. Well, his father and gave him his father gave him a slave when he went to Princeton to be his servant. Absolutely. So you know, and he, I, I say Madison was born into the arms of a slave, and a slave closed his eyes when he died. You know, at no point was he not attended to, and no, at no point did he not make his living from the labor of enslaved people. At, at his plantation. And yet, um, nevertheless, he was a central figure in the creation of our Constitution. And I think what we can say is that our original Constitution, though tainted by slavery, was broken at the time of the Civil War, broken by the Confederacy, then broken by Lincoln. And then we remade that Constitution into something new through the addition of the 13th Amendment, which banned slavery, the 14th, which guaranteed equal protection, the 15th, which enfranchised black people, at least black men at the time. and through those amendments, we created a new constitution that's different than the constitution we began with. And that one is a moral constitution that we can get behind. Now, we haven't perfectly obeyed it at all times. We had segregation, which was a violation of that, until we had run against Board of Education to tell us that the 14th Amendment prohibits segregation. So this is not an argument that we're perfect. And I'm also not arguing that we've achieved full equality in our country today. We haven't. What I'm saying is we can be proud of having a constitution that guarantees those things because it challenges us to live up to that kind of equality. And to do that, I think we can, we can all get behind that. We don't have to be so divided over the question of the framers. I, I think it's sad that we spend so much time fighting about what, what were their views? Were they racists? Uh, let's leave that to one side. Let's acknowledge that they were slaveholders, many of them, and that we changed subsequently. It took blood and sweat to do so and many lives and a great deal of bravery. 
But we did change, and we ought to try to focus on that, in my view. Did Lincoln uh, Noah think he was breaking the Constitution? Uh, did he think he was changing the Constitution? You're only supposed to change the Constitution by amendment. Um, and um, did he, in good faith, think that uh, he was breaking the Constitution when he freed the slave? It's a really, really, really hard question. Nowhere did Lincoln leave any word saying, I'm breaking faith while I'm doing this. He did, a year before he did it, say that it would be dictatorship to do so. So we know that the Lincoln of a short time previously thought it would be wrong. And we can watch his thought developing. If you ask me, and this is what I argue in the book, I think that Lincoln talked himself into the view that although his whole life and career, he had believed that emancipation like that would be unconstitutional, because it had to be done, he would do so and he would understand himself to be fulfilling the Constitution. So it's an example of somebody who really wants to do something, finding a way to tell himself that it's constitutional, even when lots of people, including some liberal Supreme Court justices, after the fact, were telling him that it wasn't constitutional, he doubled down and insisted on it. But he didn't have great answers to many of the challenges. So what we see in Lincoln is somebody, again, trying to do the right thing, and trying to offer some constitutional justification against the weight of the evidence that he had believed until that moment. Well, Lincoln, in addition to being a great emancipator, was a great lawyer. And I suppose the quality of a great lawyer is uh, to urge untenable positions uh, with a certain degree of logic and, uh, and emotion and style. So, uh, and, as you know, and as you know, Jim, a great lawyer also comes to believe the argument that he's making on behalf of his client. And in this case, Lincoln's client was himself, as it were, and he definitely came ultimately to believe that he was correct. Uh, well, he uh, believed he was correct and, uh, the, uh, and left a lasting legacy in, in that sense. But there is a principle of, I suppose it's of law, it goes back to Cicero, that in times of war, the laws are silent. Now, if uh, that principle has any application, uh, what Lincoln did was in accordance with law. Well, it wouldn't be in accordance with law. It would be in accordance with the idea that there is no law. There is no law. In certain circumstances, there is no law because the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Uh, and Lincoln believed that. That was his rationale for uh, suspending the writ of habeas corpus. Well, our Constitution doesn't say that, that the law is silent in wartime. Our Constitution says, first, that Congress has the right to declare war. And that includes the right to specify the terms of engagement and the laws of war. And then it gives the president the powers as commander in chief. And from the framers to the present day, constitutional scholars have believed that the government is bound in some sense by the international laws of war, um, which are real laws. They're not laws that are passed by Congress necessarily, although they can be incorporated by Congress into US domestic law, but those do bind us. So for example, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which we have today, tells our troops that they can't torture or otherwise violate the Geneva Conventions in wartime. That's an example of international law, the Geneva Conventions, incorporated into U.S. law by Congress. And it is the law, and it does apply in wartime. So I think our, our system, our constitutional system, doesn't buy that Roman idea. That, that fits a Roman worldview where they also believe that the emperor was above the law and outside the law and could do whatever he wanted, no matter what the law said. We don't believe that. Our president, as commander in chief, is not the emperor. Our president is just a president, just a person bound by law whose job is created by law. OK, so um, I have a question for you, Professor Noah Feldman, uh, and uh, the question in closing. And the question is, uh, did Lincoln uh, usurp the powers of the presidency in freeing the slaves? In my view, I wouldn't use the word usurp. What I would say is that Lincoln exceeded the powers of the presidency as they had been understood by everyone just about in the history of US constitutional interpretation until that moment, himself included, and even as they were understood by contemporaries. And I would say that that action was morally justified. The constitution as we then had it was not moral. It was based on a compromise with immorality, and slavery is the greatest immorality that there could be. And so it was justified morally for Lincoln to do what he did, even if it wasn't justified 
within the Constitution. Today, things are different. Today, we do have a Constitution that enshrines moral principles and moral values. And so I don't think that a president who said, it's up to me, I'm going to break the Constitution to do what I think is necessary to win this war, would be justified in doing so. I think that's the difference between the Constitution before Lincoln and the Constitution after Lincoln. Before Lincoln, the Constitution was not fundamentally a moral document, and breaking it could be justified. After Lincoln, it became a moral document, guaranteeing equal protection and due process of law. And now that it guarantees those things, a president should not have the authority or the moral right to break it. Uh, Noah Feldman, this has been just marvelous. And uh, thank you so much for coming by. And uh, thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more conversations. Please visit our website, jimzironconversations.com. Meanwhile, take care, be well, and all the best.